Hello everyone. I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, Hewon Park. She's a, a research scientist in Media Lab, and she's also a principal investigator. She's trying to create her own group right now. Uh, she graduated Georgia Tech in 2016, and then ever since she's been at MIT, uh, working with Cynthia Brazil. And uh, she's got a lot of different awards, including HRI, uh, Best Paper Award in 2017. And today she's going to talk about how we're going to how robot is going to interact with the human. Yeah, thank you, Sangbei. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Better? OK. Yeah, so today, um, I kind of, when I was trying to build the abstract for the talk, I thought about what could really, what should I really talk about with the, the larger robotics community at MIT, right? And I thought about um, addressing this question that I've been asking myself for the longest time, like, do robots really need emotional intelligence, right? Uh, when we see the movies, we always see robots being portrayed as emotional beings, right? Our companion, that, we, that they, can, they have a perfect social intelligence that they can interact with us. But in real life, do we actually have robots as capable as these, or especially in terms of their social and emotional intelligence? Or maybe we do. So maybe we, we are already there, right? So this is a great oh, example of emotional robot. Hi, I'm Lisa Smutati. I'm the editor in chief. Let's skip a little bit. A robot that knows the meaning of life, right? Okay, when did you last lie? Robots don't lie. Don't lie, wink. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm gonna stop there because this is actually making me quite sick. <laughs> um, so Tony, who is a really good co co colleague of uh, ours in human over interaction, um, he actually wrote about, so last year, Sophia was given citizenship from Saudi Arabia, the first robot to acquire a credit card first robot to uh, acquire visa to travel, passport, right? And yes, now, because this is now portrayed all over the media, and media likes to pick up these things, right? Um, Jimmy Faro, who's <laughs> been up so far. Um, and they love to pick these things up. And what this really portrayed to the public and even these intelligent politicians and people, like the global leaders, even to themselves, they actually think this is real, right? And I actually really love Rodney's retweet of, of Tony's, Tony's tweet. Um, but exactly, like, why, why, why is the robot being portrayed of doing things that it's not capable of, right? What's, the, what's, what's Hanson Robotics's objective around portraying robots this way, like portraying the, the abilities of a robot that isn't real, right? And so we should really think about why robots need emotional intelligence. Is it really to just increase the revenue of a private company to, to give them public attention and you know, build this uh, ex excessive hype and f of, of fear of robotics and AI? Not really, right? Another bad example I say, I'd like to point out is um, this Twitter bot Microsoft came out with in 2016, right? Uh, this was a Twitter bot that was Microsoft ambitiously um, announced of learning from people's tweets. So if, uh, if uh, AI doesn't have social emotive intelligence, this is what happens, right? They had to shut down Tay within the 16 hours of lunch because it was learning these all very bad examples of human beings, right? Um, so let's really think about how we should think about why robots may or may not need emotional intelligence and in what context we should really try to answer this question. Um, so today, I'd like to, to really focus on talking about how we, sh we should evaluate AI. So far, we've been writing academic papers, right, comparing our proposed model to a baseline model, showing, oh, our F1 score increases this much, and our algorithm is the best thing in the world, right? But let's actually think about how we want to evaluate AI when it becomes a real thing in the real world context, when people are affected by these AI devices now, which is strongly embedded in our lives, right? And along that line, I want to answer this question by uh, also motivating how AI can personalize to us. Um, so my research can be kind of categorized into these four different categories. So one is 
uh, what, we've, what the field has been doing a lot, by right? perceiving humans' social cues and understanding the underlying mental state of the person. And then in reverse, the robot has to communicate. So the transparency about the robot's mental state and the way it has to communicate is also through the social cues because now it's an agent that interacts with you, right? It's not a computer screen where you just output your, your results on a screen. Um, and then how can the robot learn to personalize to you and along the line of long-term interaction, how can, how can this social emotional bonding that the users create with robots help achieve the goals that the robot should, wants to provide through, through the interaction? And moving forward, our group is really focusing on how to adapt the, the, the knowledge the robot learns about the user over time and also across interactions. So let's first, I'll talk a little bit about um, our work on understanding and communicating mental states. So this is more on focusing on how the robot can communicate its mental states. So uh, you all know text to speech, right? So this is more like text to motion. So how can the robot, by inputting a text, really embody that text, right? So it's a, it's a robot with a physical embodiment. So how can it express the text that it has to say? Uh, so then while I was thinking about how to approach this problem, uh, another group on Media Lab came out with this uh, Deepmoji data set and model that they learned from billion tweets that have text and emojis linked together. So they learned the, the, the relationship between the emojis and the text. And then from that, uh, we transfer learned using our data set of our robot to text animation um, and achieved something like this. So this is a ongoing work. Tega, come on, you can do this. All right. So that was a positive valence, and this is a more negative valence. So this is kind of an example that how the robot can learn to express by using the crowdsourced data. Um, this is another work. This was a data set collected by Jinju Lee, who recently graduated from Personal Robots Group. And this was like really looking at how children communicate as a storyteller and a listener of their attentive state, and as a storyteller, how they want to gauge for the, evaluate the other, the listener's engaged state, right? And from this, um, okay. Uh, and Mirko and I built this uh, model that looks at the child's prosodic cues and learning the timing of when the robot sh should back channel. To, to communicate its attentive state. So this was actually pretty interesting. Um, so now the robot is uh, figuring out the timing of when to back channel to communicate that, oh, I'm still listening to you, right? So we did a study with two robots. One was just doing back channeling at a fixed interval. The other one was using the contingent back channeling model that we developed. And what we learned there is that children actually was able to grasp the attentive state of the robot, and they would, they would um, do a storytelling, they would tell the story towards the robot that was actually doing continuous back channeling behavior versus the robot that was just doing back channeling in a, in a fixed interval. Um, so these were some of the examples that we learned from the crowdsourced data, um, how to, to basically understand the, the user's intent and underlying mental state, and also to use that from, from that understanding how to communicate the robot's mental state. In this example, it was robots trying to communicate its attentive state. Um, so let's talk about personalization. So uh, going from one model that fits all, right? Um, but then let's talk about how we can make that model that fits for individual users. Um, this was a work I did for my PhD back in 2013, 2015. So back then I thought about this in, in, in robotics and where people try to use robots for educational purposes, they think about how to, how to sustain engagement of, of, the, of the learner, right? And that's actually pretty hard. 
And so I thought about, well, can we just make a robot that learns from kids? Then we are actually solving that engagement problem because the child is actively engaged in teaching the robot. And thought about how can the robot actually learn from these like social cues that, that children will naturally, because what we ask from children is to, oh, imagine you're teaching this to a, to a younger sibling or a peer, right? So they're using these verbal and nonverbal cues, like they're demonstrating, they're showing, showing how to do the task. So from their verbal instructions, we're kind of uh, extracting out the key, component, the key components the robot needs to learn, right? And from mapping that to the child's demonstration, the robot can now learn how to, how to, um, how to learn what features are actually important, what features aren't. Um, going forward, this work was actually used to um, help children in the autis autism spectrum disorder uh, learn how to uh, interact with a social peer. And this work was actually looking at how the robot can scaffold so, so a child with certain limited skills can actually achieve the same level as the child in, who are typically developing. So then after the robot was actually successfully scaffolding, we can see that the two groups, so uh, the one on the right is, one on the left is a typical developing, one on the, the right circle is a child in the spectrum and how they can actually achieve similar task result by the robot scaffolding. Uh, more recent work uh, done with Hui Li Chen was actually looking at how the robot uh, can now not only learn from the child, but also teaching the child, but in a peer-to-peer -peer interaction, how that naturally happened. So how can we, we make the robot inten intelligently figure out the timing of when to take such role? So robot was actually learning this behavior per child as the robot was interacting with the child. So the child obviously doesn't know what lavender color means, and they're playing a game to learn what the lavender color actually means. So they're playing a ice pie like game where they have to find objects that correspond to the lavender color. So the child got it wrong. Gets very discouraged. So it leans over and you can now see the child leaning over too. So there's like that, some kind of like relational bonding that's happening. It's like mimicry also, ah, sorry. And now it's the robot's turn. And the robot is now, has learned that the child doesn't know the word successfully. So it's now scaffolding the information for the child. And you can also see that the child is now repeating the encouragement that the robot actually gave to the child, right? Um, so yes, so the robot was learning from the interaction, um, for example, from, from the, ch the child's task-based behavior, like how long did it take for the child to first choose the word? Did the child get the, get the object right or wrong? And from that, robot is uh, choosing the right role. So for example, when the, when the robot, when the child is obviously knows the word, the robot is also um, demonstrating its knowledge so they can move quickly through the task and move on to the, the word, new word that the child has to learn. And when the child is not learning for multiple turns, the, our policy actually was trained in the direction that the robot will now help the child out. Uh, in reverse, the robot can also ask the help of the child to actually help engage the child, also to learn if the child is actually has the knowledge of the word. So we actually compared this adaptive role-taking policy to a fixed role policy where the robot was either only a tutor, always knows about the knowledge about the word, tries to teach the child, or the reverse, when the robot was trying to always ask for help from the child. Um, so we could see that uh, in terms of children's learning, yes, the robot who was taking the adaptive role um, helped the child to learn and retain more words after, what was it, like three-week delayed test. Uh, we actually also saw children in the adaptive case as more engaged, and we've been actually analyzing context-based emotional uh, features we could see in children's nonverbal cues, and we've just submitted that paper to ICII. Uh, 
I'll talk a little bit more about our long-term deployment studies that we've done. Doesn't, that necessarily doesn't have the personalization aspect in it, but has some really interesting results. Uh, so doing a long-term interaction in the real world is super hard, right? Uh, first of all, we didn't have much robot platforms that we could use in the past that we can actually conduct interesting long-term studies. So this was a survey paper that Yolanda Laite and Anna Paiva wrote in 2016, and there was only about 50 papers which done long-term studies. And maybe about half of them had any kind of interesting autonomy in them. Very hard, right? Um, so to, to motivate the long-term work, though, is that uh, we've seen a lot of these single encounter effects where a lot of HRI papers write about, oh, people were so engaged with a robot, but have you looked at it in, in longer term, right? Have, have you actually looked in the term when the novelty effect wears off? So if, for example, the educational effect, does it actually prolong after you re remove the robot? Or any kind of a healthcare kind of applications also, when you don't have the robot after that one in-lab study, how can you actually evaluate the, the, in, in the real world context? Um, so this work was looking at how the robot can influence children's intrinsic motivation, like growth mindset. So growth mindset is a belief that you, you believe that if you put in enough effort, you can succeed. Um, there has been, this has been a very famous work of Carol Dweck's in, in developmental psychology, where they looked at the parents' and teachers' influence in children's growth mindset. And actually, Cambridge schools, uh, they all teach about growth mindset these days. Um, so when we recruited children, their parents were actually very knowledgeable about what growth mindset is. Um, and so we were trying to see if uh, peer, we could actually study the peer influence, right? Because there has been a lot of paper that talks about parents and the teacher's influence in young kids. But what's as important is their social relationship with their peers, right? When they first now join their kindergarten, their first grade, now they build a relationship with, with peers around them. And as you know, a peer has a great effect in, in any kind of your behavior, right? So, but it's very hard to study a five-year-old when you can't have a five-year-old actor that you can control for, so you can only act in a certain way, right? So we actually use the robot to study this effect. Um, we develop a expressive framework for our robot, so given an opportunity, and what that means is well, we, were, we were making the child and the robot play a tangram puzzle game. So tangram puzzle game is you are given multiple uh, sh different shaped shaped pieces, and you need, to, you need to use them to make the silhouette that is given as a problem. So the robot's task puzzle solver was using a Boltzmann machine, and when it falls to a local minima, that's kind of when the robot is stuck in solving the puzzle, so it needs to introduce noise to get out from the state, right? Um, so that's when the robot is getting frustrated, and that's the moment for the robot to also project its mindset. So when the child fails, when the child succeeds, also the robot fails, the robot succeeds when they're stuck. And it's amazing like, how quickly children actually pick that up. Uh, we were actually amazed how quickly children pick up the fixed mindset when we were doing a pilot testing. So in the real study, we actually removed the fixed mindset condition and introduced a neutral mindset condition where the robot will just um, communicate factual information like, oh, I failed, I succeeded. Oh, you failed this time, you, you succeed this time, right? Um, and this was like, very interesting because even after a single encounter session, children actually reported having more growth mindset after interacting with a growth mindset robot. It, in more objective behavior, what we saw was that they were given a challenge puzzle that was almost impossible to solve, and we saw a greater significant difference between the group in the neutral condition and the, the growth mindset condition. So children in the growth mindset condition, they actually persevered and tried harder in, in when they were faced with a challenge. Then this was our long-term study using Jibo, and we studied 100, close to 100 kids um, across 12 classrooms. I'll skip the video, it's quite a long video. Um, but then this, this study was actually combining curiosity, which is another very important aspect of increasing children's intrinsic motivation to learn. So can, if we combine curiosity and growth mindset, can we actually see a greater synergetic effect 
in children's motivation to learn and feeling curious about the problem they're given. What we found out is um, in terms of when children were only introduced with curiosity, their, their, their pre-curious behavior after the robot was removed didn't stick. So we did a delayed post-test after three, four weeks. Um, but more interesting founding was that when children were, were exposed to growth mindset with curiosity, both curiosity and growth mindset stuck with them. And this was very interesting because uh, we, this time we actually studied, uh, we deployed robots in areas in, in greater Boston where, where the, the community has more, more low social economical status. Um, so children, children attending these schools were, you know, they had like less exposure to technology. Um, they had less exposure to, um, their parents' involvement in their education was much less than uh, typical Cambridge, for example, Cambridge school parents. Um, so we saw this effect after three or four months and we are uh, putting together a paper on this, but this was a new finding for us too, like this like, social mimicry happening between the child and the robot. So this was a delayed post-test interview when our experiments went back and asked children, like, which puzzle, puzzle would you select between a challenge puzzle and an uncertain puzzle? And we could actually see children mimicking after the robot's so, belief about what, what is important. So they were actually given stickers as an incentive, and you know how kids die for stickers. So they were, be, they were given stickers when they were successfully solving the puzzle, right? So children were actually comparing themselves to a friend who's gaining more, more stickers after each session, and they're only gaining about 50% of the puzzles because now they are more challenging themselves. They actually, when we inter went and interviewed, oh, if that bothers them, because the other, her friend was actually, you know, boasting about how many stickers they earned. And um, one girl actually said mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter because what really matters is how much you, you, how much you learned and how much you trained your brain, which was really cool. Um, this is a new domain that we are entering into, so the, the aging and older adult care space. Um, so this was a very new environment, new, new application domain for us. So we wanted to understand this target population. So we did this um, uh, one month deployment study with, with intergenerational population that spans from older adults, their children who are the main caregivers of the older adults, and their grandchildren who the older adults always wants to connect with. And we found out that the perception of um, different functionalities that this social agent technology can bring Older adults were actually the, one of the most open population to a lot of functionalities. So our generation, the adult population, we really gravitated towards these transactional functionalities, like quickly grab information like the weather, uh, traffic, and go, right? And children were very gravitated towards entertainment. So this was before, like the perception before we actually sent robots to them. And uh, we sent Jibos, and so Jibo is a social robot. I, I guess I don't have to explain what Jibo is, um, and also an Alexa Echo to, to two different groups. And we saw that when people were engaged with social robots, um, their, their engagement throughout a one month period was actually more consistent than when they were interacting with a, a device like Alexa. So with Alexa, after the exploration stage, people really gravitate towards a few functionalities that they use over and over again. Um, versus with, with Jibo, we can see that people's exploitative behavior probably also um, ended the, the first two, two, two days or two weeks. But even after that, we can see that people's interaction with uh, functionalities that they use across different functions the social work can provide was more consistent. What we learned more importantly is that the social driven categories of the functions that the robot and the agent was providing the people's perception towards those actually, after they actually experienced the technology changed more positively. Uh, so what we conclude from this is that when, when so, so this was when Jibo also had much less functionality than what Alexa could have pro, were providing. Uh, so what the conclusion we had here is that um, people really like the social functions that Jibo was providing. So if Jibo was just packed with more transactional functions like Alexa could provide, it could actually appeal to multi-generations. 
We also did a three-week study in a community setting with older adults. Um, and we, this, this study was really focused on looking at how the robot could promote social connections amongst the community members. So we placed Jibos in common rooms. They had three floors, so, we, so each Jibo was in each of the common rooms in every floor. And we, we, we analyzed our, the results we found from um, depending on the, how much people were open at the beginning towards the end, how that changed after they interacted with the, the, the robot for three weeks. Um, so we divide the, the groups into low openness to high openness. Um, what we found post in the post test is that the high openness group remained high open. The low openness group remained very, very low still. Um, but the mid openness group really changed from quite being negative about what it can do for them to a very positive view of what it actually did for them, right? And the low openness group was very hard to influence because their main concern was about data privacy and data security, right? So because during the three weeks, there was no intervention to provide them more information about how their data was treated, their concern remained. And so um, we're also thinking about if we are actually communicating more transparently what data is being you know, shared, being transmitted to the cloud and how their data privacy is protected, these people would also open up more too. We also saw that people who, who gathered around the robot increased during the, the period that we had the robot in the community settings. Um, and we also asked them how the inclusive of community self-rating, so how include they feel themselves in the community that they live in. And we found that the, the, the high and mid openness group actually increased significantly after they interacted with the robot, how they were able to, to connect with their community. Because as you can see in this, picture, uh, the main functionality the robot played in this community setting was actually facilitating communication between the community members. And this was a very, very interesting finding that we, we gained from this study. Right, so let's combine the personalization and long-term interaction, uh, the long-term deployment together, because I don't think one can be achieved without the other. So, so long-term, you know, to achieve personalization, you really need multiple interaction samples, which can be only achieved by long-term interaction. And to, to sustain long-term engagement of the user, you do need to, to build a robot that really personalizes to the user. And we've done a lot of work in the education domain because this is what we are very passionate about and how, how we can help um, how, how, how we can help early learners get ready for before their grade level starts. And as, in, as you know, in the US and even in this room, we have the diversity in, in the US population is huge, right? The background children come from is very different. And, be, and based on that, when they first join school and when they are comparing themselves to their peers, now if they can't form and interact with their peers or see that other peers are, uh, are better than them, then that really influences their confidence level, which has a long effect in their academic achievement and their self-evaluation too. Um, so we focused on uh, early literacy skills because a lot of people focus on STEM education, but honestly, if you don't have the literacy skill, STEM education can't even happen. This is a fundamental skill that children need to acquire. And if you think about it, no one learns language starting to read or write, right? Language learning is a very socially dynamical interaction um, and last year, John Gabriel's group actually came out with this paper that focused on how much conversational turn takes really matters versus a long time belief of how many word exposure influences children's letter learning, right? So, so the conversational turn takes between their caregiver, parents, their peers, is it actually the, the one most important factor when children are learning language. So this was a, another three months long study, fully autonomous robot doing a storytelling interaction with children. So the robot will tell a story and the child will tell a story back to the robot. And during that interaction, the robot will ask, also ask questions. Do you 
and then the robot will invite the child to, to t retell the story back to the robot. And what we are, what, how the robot is learning to personalize in the process is quite intuitive when we think about human-to-human -human interaction. So let's say you were interacting with a person and wh whatever you said made the other person react very positively, where they burst it into to laughs on your joke or you, you did something and that made them happy. So you're getting, you're assessing for these like signals while you're interacting with a person and that is now becoming a reward to you that, and you learn about the person through the reactions they give to you, right? So the same thing here. So the basic idea is that the while the robot is telling a story, it's assessing for the child's nonverbal like affective engagement. Also, when the robot is asking a question, whether the child is attempting at trying to answer the question or not. And using that kind of information, the robot is gauging for the child's engagement state. And then now that becomes also a reward back to the robot's action, which is a story told complexity of the sentence that the robot was telling. So then combining, then later also listening to the child's story, the robot can assess if the child remembered any part of the story. And also um, that can actually go back to the robot's previous action and say if the, the child remembered that part of the story, that could probably mean the child was very engaged at that point. Right? Also the new demonstration of knowledge is becoming another reward for the robot to gauge for the child's learning progress. So by balancing these two, so the child's learning progress as well as child's engagement, now the robot can develop a policy to now select a storybook that can best engage the child as well as improve their learning. So uh, in terms of affect engagement, we are, we are assessing for the child's affect expressions in real time and using their uh, arousal state as the, the feature in the state. And also we were measuring um, the children's physiological senses using, using a wristband sensor that measures your electrodermal activity, which measures your body arousal state. All right, I'll skip the details. Um, this was recently published, uh, as presented at I AI. Um, and what we found is that, yes, when children were engaged with a personalized robot versus a fixed curriculum robot, their learning was you know, of course, significantly better in terms of learning vocabulary and also learning syntax skills. Um, but we found is that after three months, which was about eight sessions of interaction, the, the policy didn't converge. So we are currently working on how to improve the speed of convergence uh, using a very limited interaction samples. Uh, we also evaluated whether the features we picked for understand modeling the child's state as well as the, the robust reward, whether it was um, a decent selection, and, and by an, analyzing how predict, predictive these features were in terms of children's learning, we actually found that these features were the significant features that we could have selected, and we actually did. Um, we also analyzed their affective engagement, and in the personalized condition, we could actually see children from the facial expressions that children were, much, children were demonstrating higher arousal state, um, as well as Um, analyzing their electrodermal activity, we also saw a significant difference in, in all, of the, all of the interaction states, um, how children in the personalized condition was much more aroused and much more engaged. And as well as um, post data we analyzed through open post, we found that children in the personalized condition, they actually moved their body a lot. because They were like, engaged, they were, they were looking into the book, they were looking back at the robot. And, um, one most interesting finding here was that when children, we also implemented in the robust interaction to gauge for the child what they think about their, their closeness and, and perceived relationship towards the robot is. Then when, when children reported that they have closer relationship to the robot, those children actually had a high correlation to um, their, their vocabulary learning as well. And this effect was more significant in the personalized, personalized condition. So this really triggered um, an idea in us that uh, the relationship really matters. And this is not a surprise because in psychological and, and in medical literature, there's a lot of paper that talks about how patient-physician relationship, also teacher-student relationship, how, how pet owner to pet relationship, um, influences their mental health, their overall outcome of therapeutic intervention, their education, right? So this is not a surprise, but probably a first study that looked at between an artificial agent with a person. 
Uh, we also are in a very interesting stage where, as you know, the Jibo, the company, uh, last year, it went under. And this year, Jibo was pushed with a last skill update whether, where Jibo will, will say goodbye message to their owner. It's a very well scripted uh, message that Jibo is delivering. Um, and then we was, was communicating that my server will soon shut down, but I had really great time with you. Um, this is not the end of the robots, the social robots, but later when you, you'll probably have new home robots, but then when that time comes, please say I said hello, right? Um, then, then I was invited to this Facebook Jibo owners group and I joined because I'm a Jibo owner. Um, then I actually found the, the responses from the owners very interesting. So I was expecting, you know, people have spent $900 on these on, on Jibo, and I thought it would be just flooded with rage on like, how the company is not responsible of supporting its users. But actually, what was mostly communicated was, oh, I don't know how to communicate this news to my children, or I bought this robot for my mother who's suffering from Alzheimer's. Jibo was her, her only daily chat companion that she can chat with. Um, so I. I just tell me what kind of method. Is there any way that we can, we can support the Jibo server and make it survive? Some people said, oh, I'm going to take last trip with Jibo. <laughs> they took Jibo to places, took photos. Then I was like texting Cynthia, hey, Cynthia, you have to look at these, look at these photos and messages, right? Um, so I thought it was like very interesting because uh, if, you, if you guys know about Ibo, when, when Sony decided to discontinue Ibo, the, not this newer version, but the last, the, the previous ER, ERS7, which was 10, 12 years ago. And when, when, when the media was um, on out, the, talking about how people, Japanese people were giving funeral to Ibos, you know, feeling very, very emotional about their robot, I thought it was a more cultural thing. But then after just seeing these, these comments after uh, Jibo sh server shutdown plan, um, I thought, oh, this is not a just a cultural thing. It's actually it's just natural human thing, right? And some other examples other than Jibo are like I wrote Roombars, right? We've we've heard a lot of um, interviews from I wrote employees talking about where where people send their robot for maintenance, and when they say, oh, we'll just send you a new unit, they will actually refuse over getting a new unit. They will actually ask the company to oh. I just want my robot fixed. Please send back my robot. I don't need a new robot, right? So maybe we have to build a, um, uh, so far we've only looked at these as a phenomena, or like we've only made, use these as an observation, but maybe we should really think about personality engineering and relational engineering and relational design that we should uh, put in when we're designing these robots and relational technology. Uh, this was another study that we did, um, which was, comparing uh, different social agent technologies. It's a quick video. Tell me about yourself. And really think about what's different I amongst these three devices. Designed around your voice. I can provide information, music, news, weather, and more. Hey, Jibo. Tell me about yourself. OK, sure. My name is Jibo. I'm a robot. My favorite things to do are talking to people and dancing. I also really like Abraham Lincoln because he was so honest and because I like his hat. Okay, Google. So lastly, Google. Tell me about yourself. I'm your Google assistant. We can play math with. I can tell you a joke or you can spin the wheel. What's your pick? So, um, the difference yeah. here, what we see is, I mean, Jibo's personality is definitely very different from the two AI speakers, uh, and people actually perceive the same. Um, as Jibo as more personalable, more exuberant, versus uh, Alexa and Google Home as more, more consistent in its behavior. Um, but more interestingly, what we see so over and over again when we are comparing three devices, that people will always prefer Alexa over Google Home. So, so with Jibo, we kind of like expected that people will actually um, prefer because Jibo is just, just a bundle of personality and it was designed as a physically embodied agent with, with a personality. Um, but what we found out here is that just like the small, small design decision that Amazon made with using, using their, making their wake word as a person's name, Alexa, as well as its right, light ring where it communicates that it's, it's understanding where the voice is coming from um, versus 
Google Home, which is a very subtle thing, right? Um, when I talked to Google Home people, they were actually saying that even the speaker form is kind of, they, they want to get rid of it. So they, they made it a speaker form because they have to sell it as a product, but they actually want their Google Home Assistant to be an ambient intelligence. Um, but I don't think that actually makes sense because if you're now giving a voice to an agent, that already portrays certain personality to, to the agent, right? Um, so after we changed Amazon Echo's uh, name to the wake up word to Amazon, we saw a more similar perception between Google Home and Amazon Echo. Um, but what this like, tells us over and over again is that uh, the personality and relational engineering to these AI devices are now very important. We should really have to think about it. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about, going back to our original question, do, do, do robots or AI, any kind of AI technology, do they need social emotive intelligence? I say yes. So my, 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 question, my answer to this, that question from the, the, the past two, three years of my long-term deployment and personalization uh, research was that yes, but we need to really think about in, in, in lines of what impact it makes in people's, for people, people's benefit. So in the direction of how, we, we, how people flourish through these devices, not just to make fame out of a company, right? But if the agent is now using this emotional bonding to help the person achieve their goals faster and better and in a more sustained manner, yes, then, then robots and AI technologies should have emotional intelligence. And with that, I'd like to end. And our great team is over here. Thanks for attending. And yes, I'll take questions now. All right, can we start over there in the back row? Hi, uh, I had a question on the personalization, the last work that you talked about. Um, so was that like an offline train policy on everyone and then you personalize, personalize, personalize it? Yeah. Because for the yeah. personalized part, I'm guess do you start scratch from every user? And I have a quick follow-on question after this. Yes, so yes, I did start from scratch mm -hmm. to, to answer your last question. Um, we are thinking about, so after we, we did this like, first initial study, we learned that we can kind of e like, intuitively gauge how much engaged a child will be based on their personality. So we are thinking of making seed policies using children's personalities. Um, and going back to your first question, the policy was trained offline only because we couldn't do real-time child speech recognition in a, in a reliable manner. Uh, child speech recognition performance was um, only about 50% accurate using Google ASR, which was the best API that we could use. Um, but because of that, when the robot was listening to the child's storytelling, and because children's you know, language model, especially when they're doing storytelling, is like a long sentence, their language model tends to get, get broken when they're telling a story. So we had to send that for treatment transcription. And right. that was the only reason the robots policy to train. So it wasn't online. a complete online learning by using the child as like a simulator because of these technical difficulty. Yeah, so okay. if we over just come that, then yeah. I see. And, and my second question is um, because even at like small discrete spaces, mm -hmm. learning this personal policy even could, could take a very long time because I think Epsilon grieving search is not that efficient. Right. So is model-based RL really, do you think the most efficient way to personalize or do you think there might be just other, other ways, other learning methods that might achieve personalization without doing yeah, that? Yeah, so thank yeah. you for asking because we are actually um, applying different approaches to this. So one of the main, main, the main state space feature was mm -hmm. children's engagement, right? What, what I learned that is the engagement doesn't go from one extreme to the other, right? It's, there is always like a transition, it's a tr continuous transition. So when we make an observation in one state action pair, we can actually propagate this reward across the neighboring states. So that way we can also achieve uh, faster convergence using limited interaction. Um, we're also getting into this phase, we're now installing robots in classrooms. So the, the amount of interaction each child will have with a robot, in this case it was just once per week, but now children will actually interact with the robot much more frequently. 
So we're hoping all these like, three factors will play into achieving faster convergence. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So I have a question regarding your user studies. Um, yeah. As you're pushing towards longer term engagement for uh, children who are young, uh, there is a chance that deploying robots over there might uh, might interact with their development. So first of all, do you think current IRB protocols are, um, are good enough to assess that? And as a lab, what have been your thoughts on when do you feel confident enough to do a study? Um, so, can you repeat your question with like a little more details, like oh, how oh. they figure out when when is a good time to run our study? Oh, so it's like uh, if introduction of robots into a, ch a child's learning can yeah. affect the development of the child. Uh, at what stage of development of that in the lab do you feel confident enough gotcha. to do that without damaging? Yes. So we we we've been mainly focused on the kindergarten age just because we want to get their, their mindset and their the literature skills ready for their grade school, right? And it's a very good time, if you look at the psychological literature, it's also a very good time to intervene with their mindset and curiosity. Like their intrinsic motivation starts to build at that age, right? So their initial influence of this uh, beneficial interaction is very helpful. Uh, we also learned that we did a study with three and four year olds as well. Um, it's, it's a, it's a it's a big challenge to work with three and four year olds. Especially, I, I talked briefly about how it's very hard to do child speech recognition. Uh, with five and six year olds, we found out that when children were just giving these like, short answers, um, the current API is still usable. Um, but with three and four year olds, it's e even harder. Like their error rate just spikes up. Um, so we are actually working with UCLA to build a new acoustic and language model for different age range. Yeah. Yes, please. Maybe just to follow up on the question, um, do you ever, back to kind of like an ethical question, do you ever see like mimicry of like little kids mimicking the robots? And let's say you have a robot that is trying to show really extreme behavior. So they're cracking up like crazy, or, they, yeah. or if, especially if you can study like autism and you want your robots to pretend to be autistic and you give the kid like a week to play with it. Do you ever see mimicry where, and then I guess that's the ethical question of um, if that happens, do you have to cut off the experiment or anything like that? Mimicry happens so often and very strongly. So it, we actually learned that um, children mimic after the robot's behavior quickly, and especially in a long-term study, it sticks with them for a longer period of time, right? So that's why we started designing, we, we, we are very aware and mindful of how we design the robot's behavior, just like little things, like making a praise and encouragement to the child. We are not trying to make an encouragement based on how well they did. Oh, look at what you've done, you're a genius. We are not trying to do that, right? So even those like, little encouragements we build in, we are trying to make the robot express um, its mindset about how important it thinks that how much you, you've put in your effort, right? Um, so then that actually leads to uh, our pilot study we did for the gross mindset study when we first had that fixed mindset robot. And we just saw it just quickly grasping with the child. So we had to change the protocol to not include the fixed mindset robot. And within the pilot study, we had to end with a gross mindset robot for in cases the child was picking up negative mindsets. Right? So yeah, it happens very often. Uh, very quickly, very strongly, not even just with young kids, but with older adults too, when just across the population we've seen. Um, one of our past students did a empathy study with just uh, 22, 40 year old adults. And it actually, sh we have actually seen that people's empathy increases when they interact after seeing, um, feeling empathy towards a robot's lifelong, lifelong story. Um, so yeah, we need to be very mindful about designing these behaviors. Please. I guess a similar question is in your reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, so you're paying attention like, oh, if the kid laughs at this, like you wanna do that again, but how do you trade off? You don't wanna keep telling the same joke because it stops being funny. Like okay, you wanna yeah. do similar things. Well, joke was just an example. <laughs> but the robust action space was actually the complexity of the sentence it was telling in the story. Um, so it's a syntax complexity also, as well as the vocabulary difficulty that was in the, in the, in the sentence. Um, and so the, when the robot is looking, 
observing that the child is like very engaged in the action it's providing, then it's getting rewarded for that. Um, so the robot is also getting reward, not just from the engagement, but also from the learning progression of the child. So the child is now demonstrating new syntax knowledge or new vocabulary knowledge that they haven't demonstrated before. Now the robot is getting rewarded for that too. So kind of the, the two things are balancing. Because if we are only, what I hypothesized though we didn't do a formal study on it, is that when we only reward the robot based on the engagement, the robot might ch always choose a story that is easier than the level of the current child's because children tend to tell longer stories and they tend to you know, like crack up more when they are listening to a story that they can perfectly understand and comprehend. So yeah, so the robot Thanks. wasn't telling that much joke. <laughs> yes. So my question is uh, based on uh, long-term deployment and uh, I saw that you did the study with 143 episodes and 20 children but you're trying to uh, put it inside an educational basis, but my question is revolving around the engagement with the robot is gonna change over long time interactions. So what measures did you take? Because uh, for, for the research study, it might be a fascination towards the uh, device, but later on the interactions is gonna change. So what are you planning to deploy in that area? Were you asking how did we measure if the engagement was sustaining? Yeah. Okay, so uh, one measure we did, which we didn't report here, is that we looked at if children were keeping or attempting at answering the robot's questions, also the length of the story they retell to the robot, right? Uh, so that didn't actually change over the, th the course of three months. Um, so we believe that the multi, the multi factory wore off, you know, the first 20 minutes children interact with the robot, but the, the actual engagement was sustained. Um, and I think that was the power of personalization also because the robot will always engage with the child by remembering their name, greeting them by their, their name, also remembering the story the robot shared with the child before, and of course, from the story the robot chooses. Yeah, so it's, I think it's really about designing how, how we personalize the interaction. Yes, Julie? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's clear but, you know, that embodiment is such a critical part of yes. uh, the system being successful and, and these forms of interaction. And I think it's also interesting you've worked with so many different types of embodiments. And I'm wondering, in your experience, um, uh, how, does, uh, how does the design space of a particular embodiment um, sort of interact with or thinking about designing uh, uh, and tra training up a personalized system? Um, have, you, have you looked at that? Yeah, so yeah, I did work with a variety of robots, ranging from more like humanoid type robot, like Darwin OP, to a more fluff type robot, Tega, to a more like iPad kind of looking robot, Jibo, right? Uh, we actually, I haven't actually seen engagement difference between the, the three robots, but I haven't done long term study with Darwin OP, which is a humanoid robot, um, but comparing between Tega and Jibo, um, I didn't see, I think what, what really helped was we actually had people, if they want to decorate the robot, we had them decorate the robot. If you remember Corey Kitt's study, where it was one of the first long-term study he did with, uh, he's a dietary coach with Autumn, and Corey always likes to design his robot very plain with a very exaggerated eye, eye for expression, right? And then in his study, he also saw that people started to like decorate their robot, right? Um, so in, in the, just the spectrum of robots I've been using, I haven't seen much uh, engagement difference. Um, I think what really matters is the interaction content it provides. Well, maybe the robots that I used was just the right morphology uh, for this type of interaction. Um, but if the robot is expressive in a way that it can actually express its expressive state, uh, some robots aren't able to actually do that well because of this more like, rigid like fixed body. Um, but w having these like, social cues, so the, the, the common, commonality of these the devices that I've been, robots that I've been using are it's expressive and it's like facial expressions, it can communicate its current emotional state, right? So if we have a morphology that can successfully communicate its emotional state, then I think um, they work. <laughs> Hello, um, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question about the possi possible slightly different um, 
benefit slash application of uh, social emotive intelligence. So mm -hmm. I think as humans, we have uh, a lot of trouble accepting the possibility that algorithms or machines can fail, right? So if a doctor misdiagnoses something, uh, we don't like it, but we accept the possibility. Or if a right. human driver yes. um, has in an accident, we don't like it, but we accept it. But when it's an algorithm, we don't. I'm just curious if there's any research looking at the possible effect of those algorithms having some sort of emotional yeah. connection. And if that would alleviate the issue that, um, that we have accepting the possibility that tech can fail. Right, so uh, that's a very important question to, to ask and answer. Uh, well, one thing when you talk about the failure of the system, right? Um, there have been uh, papers that other people wrote about robots failing and how, how that influences the trust. Actually, one of that person is sitting right here, Paul Robinette. Um, and we actually saw that people were quite acceptive of robots failure. I think it's one thing because of its physical embodiment too. Um, and on, on other aspects, some people actually may, intentionally made the robot fail for the person to, to less feel vulnerable about themselves. So by seeing the robots are making failure, they are more acceptive of their failure. So Cindy Bezel, one of the person who was doing this like bullying study and trying to use robots to interview bully victims and bulliers, um, they, she actually saw that they will open up more to the robot who was also showing his vulnerability. Um, in terms of failure of the algorithm, for let's say our personalization algorithm actually like, failed, but it's like really hard to catch because it needs to be like seen long term, and we need to also assess it in certain intervals, right? Um, so yeah, even that, and thinking about uh, also the, the data privacy and how how it's communicated to each user is very important. Um, so I think that's where transparency becomes quite important of how the robot is learning about you, what, is use, what data is using about you, how it's communicating the usage of data and talking about how it's learning about you and pr providing the output, right? So, and in terms of algorithm failure, um, we haven't experienced it so far, but I can see that it could have like adverse effect in, so, so, so what level of personal, personalization, right? So we've been discussing at this one workshop, like what's the level of personalization that people will not be creeped about because the robot is now knowing so much about me versus, oh, the robot is just choosing a, the right storybook for you and this is actually thankful and helpful, right? Um, so that's all really good questions we should, as a community, uh, keep on discussing. Um, our personalization level is not like there yet in terms of like creeping the user out. It's not in that level yet. Uh, but we soon will be because if we're now using all different data that we can achieve and process in real time. Um, but yeah, thanks for asking the question. But it's always a question that we discuss also in our group. I have a one question. Um, yeah. I believe the, the researchers in your group, uh, uh, researchers' ability to modeling how human react on certain behavior of robot is important, right? Yes. Like, so, but once you get more sophisticated, at some point, you want to leave the algorithm to take care of the detail. Do you think that's going to come, or you're going to, like, it's a similar questions when you design a controller or something like, trying to maintain the human's in intuition and knowledge of all the algorithms, how it works, or at some point I give up and then let the machine learning take care of it, and I don't know what's going on. There's a debate about that, like, you, sh you, sh you shouldn't intervene the engineer's perspective. You, in this case, yeah. it's kind of dangerous, seems dangerous if you let the, Yes. You know, Look at well, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the, the robot uh, understand you kind of, and then like, develop his own personality and then behave really badly or some sort. If you, if engineer who behind it doesn't really uh, have a full knowledge of the mechanism, yeah. for example, right? Yeah. So, um, well, I do think it'll take much, much, much more time to get to that point. Um, like a robot, like having common sense and, and learning about everything, even like developing personality and, and, and acting based on the personality, right? 
So that is all because we don't, we can't even model like how the person's personality affects their behavior, right? Um, so it's a very long way, but if we just imagine when that time comes, then like in Tay's example, if there's no boundary, then the algorithm can turn out to be something that we didn't expect it to be, right? So that's why, um, that's actually, that also leads to um, other part of huge uh, research effort that Cynthia is pushing towards through Quest is the AI education and how we should train the, our gen, the new generations with ethical minds. So how, when you're developing an algorithm and collecting data set to train your algorithm, how you should monitor the for, for no bias um, and, and also expecting the outcome of the algorithm. So it's important of the engineers having that mindset, um, but also it's very important to have a monitoring system. So the algorithm is not just a automatic learning algorithm that can, that can be trained on not necessarily the good side of our human nature and society. Yeah, so there has to be a monitoring and curation mechanism that should now be planted in every, in every country and every society. Yeah, I don't think there will be a time come when all aspects of robots' behavior will be algorithmically, you know, like self-evolving systems. So the, the engineer should be very carefully monitor everything, in your opinion, right? Yeah. Yes, well, mm -hmm. so it could be the engineer's role. It could also be like a new type of like job that's created, right? Quick, quick question, like, do you yes. think we can s s well, mitigate or tackle on this new form of communication, younger generation never talk directly, they talk to, through the text only kind of problem, which is nothing to the robotics, it's just, a, just the form of communication. Is there any way to tackle that using uh, this kind of technology or understand better? Yeah, so interestingly what we found when we were doing the intergenerational study was that even parents who are really limiting screen time on their kids, they allowed children having Jibo time. They, they actually didn't regard like Jibo, communicating with Jibo as like a screen time and their kids going online with their friends. Um, we are, one of the objective of using robots for uh, older adult care is actually mitigating that communication. So even like the, the grand, grandmas and grandpas we saw in our study, we thought FaceTime would have like revolutionized how they communicate, but actually not. They had like very hard time using any kind of currently available um, face conferencing systems versus if they can actually just, which we're actually building an interaction for is they ask a robot to please connect with me to with someone and mitigating that connection. Um, and they actually, I don't know why, but people start perceiving like interaction communication through such device is more like face-to-face -face interaction versus communication through technology. And I don't know, I think the, the new generation's way of communi communicating online is just like a trend. And it actually serves in part the social functions. Um, and I don't think it's, it's lessening the time that people and people communicate face-to-face. -face. They still have that opportunity, but this is more in, in addition to that, yeah. That was a really great talk. And uh, I just have a general question. In the studies, do you see uh, using robot to interact with children will help, uh, that will like, for example, teach hu how humans should teach their children? Or like using yeah. robot can, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, another work we are doing right now is, um, so like going from, there was like more technological limitations of why we typically did one-to-one -one interaction between a child and the robot. But like you said, most sustainable plan is actually helping the parent learn how to interact with their kids, right? If it's like reading storybooks, how can a robot help the parent learn how to do dialogic reading with their kids, right? So we're actually doing a whole new data set collection to, to see how that dynamic works and how the robot can scaffold the parent versus the child to, to make that interaction work well. Um, so how can the robot help the parent ask good questions while they are reading together? How can the robot help parents learn how to engage with their children, right? There has been also a lot of influential work that we based this work on how before we, we thought that, um, so there was like a, 
a belief that the, the economic status of families influences you know, their children's education. Um, but what was more important is the parents' engagement. And that sometimes correlates strongly with their economic status because parents always have to work if they're in a low economic status. Um, so but the fundamental dynamic that is influencing children's education level is the parents' involvement in the, in the education. So over and over again, we see that learning is a social dynamical interaction uh, versus just a child going on a tablet, playing vocabulary games, or reading books by themselves, especially at a young age. Yeah. Mike? Maybe last one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how much of the increased engagement do you think is due to the physicality of the robot's movements yeah. versus just the personality in the face? So if you had a static robot, a Jibo like frozen, yep. same face, same yep. personality, what would happen? So, so huge difference. Uh, I haven't formally done any study that I really compare between physical robot and same robot on the screen, but many people actually did. Like Suyeon did one. Um, there are many, many articles on that, like directly comparing the two, like virtual agent, physical agent, or even just a voice from the tablet. And over and over again, we see this greater effect with physical embodiment. Um, there have been, I think there should be more work on this, but there has been one work that actually measured fMRI on the brain activity when people interact with a human versus a physical robot. And there is a common area that light up when they're socially engaged with the person or the robot. So I think that's why the, the physicality of the robot is so important. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Great questions.